Foundation. I'd like to welcome all of you, those online and here in person, to today's presentation on pancreatic cancer. A quick note for those of you on the webinar, if you'd like to ask Dr. Hang a question, please submit it via the chat function at any time during the presentation. We will collect these questions until the Q&A period begins at the end of the presentation. We will get to as many questions as we can during the time that we have. And now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Zhu Ha Huang, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Washington. Dr. Huang specializes in early detection of gastrointestinal malignancies, including esophageal, gastric, pancreatic, bile duct, and colon cancer. He has spent many years performing novel research in focused ultrasound cancer treatment and the enhancement of drug delivery. He is also the principal investigator of a new foundation-organized multinational registry for focused ultrasound treatment of pancreatic cancer. Today, he will discuss gaps in current therapies and the role focused ultrasound could play in treating this disease. Dr. Huang, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Neil Cassell and the Foundation for inviting uh, me here to the Foundation to provide this webinar on uh, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, well, we'll talk today about the role of focused ultrasound in the treatment of pancreatic cancer, and to start off with, I'd like to uh, give basically a broad overview of pancreatic cancer. I know that we have a, um, uh, an audience that has various interests. Some may be more specialized in pancreatic cancer and others might have more of a focus in focused ultrasound. So um, I'll, I'll be relatively broad and give uh, uh, a detailed overview over pa of, about pancreatic cancer. And then we'll uh, delve into the current status of HIFU and pancreatic cancer talk about what's being done right now, which is primarily local ablation and palliation of pain, and then really discuss um, the exciting future potential applications of HIFU, and that includes enhanced dr drug delivery, and we'll talk about some uh, mechanisms, including uh, cavitation and hyperthermia, and also some newer developments in the area of histotripsy, uh, biomarkers, uh, immune therapy, and then also, uh, as was mentioned, I'm a gastroenterologist, and uh, we'll talk about uh, endoscopic ultrasound-guided HIFU, which uh, is something that uh, may be beneficial, particularly for a pancreatic cancer. So just to give a background um, on uh, the, the significance of pancreatic cancer, if you look at cancer incidence, and this is from the SEER database for two estimated cases in the U.S. for 2017, if you look at the ranking, uh, pancreatic cancer is down at uh, number 12, 53,670 uh, cases are estimated for 2017. Um, and this has actually climbed substantially. I remember when I started talking about this back in you know, 2005, the number was 32,000. So uh, unlike most ca cancers, pancreatic cancer is uh, uh, trending upward significantly. So the incidence appears to be low, but the significance of this is if you look at cancer deaths in the U.S., this year it's actually estimated to surpass breast cancer. So in the past I used to always say it was the fourth leading cause of cancer deaths in the U.S. Now it's become the third leading cause of cancer deaths in the U.S. Uh, so al it's almost uniformly fatal. Uh, I mentioned that 53,000 would be diagnosed, well 43,000 will, will die of pancreatic cancer this year. So it has, a, it has an extremely high mortality rate. Um, and then if you look at five-year survival uh, by cancer type, pancreatic cancer is, has the lowest five-year survival. This is data look, um, it, from the period between 2007 to 2013. The number's gone up. So again, you know, f five, ten years ago, the five-year survival was in the 5% range, and so now we've bumped it up to about 8%. But compared to every other malignancy out there, pancreatic cancer uh, clearly has uh, a way to go in terms of improving therapies. Uh, it, uh, if you look at other cancers, you know, breast cancer in the past, you know, it had, used to have a low survival rate in the 50% range, but now we're up to almost 90% five-year survival for all comers. So uh, it just shows that if we put effort in turn, in, in, into research uh, that we can make an impact. And unfortunately, up until now, pancreatic cancer has been underfunded. But you know, hopefully uh, with efforts of the foundation and 
uh, through lobbying of the NIH will increase funding for pancreatic cancer and improve long-term survival for patients who uh, are devastated by this disease. And I do think that focused ultrasound has a, a bright future to play in that. So third leading cause of cancer deaths in the U.S., uh, 53,000 case, new cases and 43,000 deaths in 2017. This is a worldwide problem, too, actually. There's a higher incidence outside the U.S. Uh, there are over 340,000 new cases diagnosed worldwide. And of the cases that present, uh, 80 to 90 percent are considered unresectable, which is the same as saying they're uncurable right now, because the only way we can cure pancreatic cancer is to do surgery, and cure rates are very low. And the reason that um, most present as unresectable disease is uh, the pancreas, as I'll show uh, you in a little bit, is Please stand by while your recording connection often, is established. And often uh, don't have symptoms until the, the disease has progressed significantly. So this conference uh, pancreas is being cancer recorded. has very poor outcomes, a median survival without therapy on the order of three to six months median survival with therapy, 6 to 12 months. It's probably up to 18 months uh, at this point, but still very, very poor outcomes. One of the most significant uh, problems with pancreatic cancer is it almost always causes significant pain. And um, for those of you who have known patients or friends who've suffered with pancreatic cancer, you really realize how much pain um, debilitates patients towards the end of life. So. Pain relief uh, and palliation of pain plays a very significant role in managing patients with pancreatic cancer, and that's uh, where HIFU already has been demonstrated to be of some benefit in international studies. So just to go over the anatomy of the pancreas, the pancreas um, is a deep organ. It lies behind the stomach. Uh, so here's the stomach, here's the liver. Um, it lies behind the stomach, which is a little bit of a problem in terms of access for ultrasound. Um, it's a gland uh, that is kind of long. It has a duct that runs down the middle of it called the main pancreatic duct. And it ex this duct exits in into the duodenum via something called the major papilla, which uh, it often shares a common channel with the bile duct. Uh, and that's significant in that this, if a lesion develops in the pancreatic head, uh, oftentimes the initial symptom or the initial presentation is something what we call painless jaundice. The uh, patients turn yellow because of obstruction from the bile duct. Uh, if a small lesion presents there and happens to obstruct the bile duct, that's the best case scenario for these patients because they can potentially have a curative resection, uh, but it typically doesn't uh, occur that way. So here's another picture, and this depicts a mass in the pancreatic head, uh, and I took this from the Mayo Clinic website. Uh, but here's the bile duct, and you can see how uh, its proximity to the bile duct uh, will result in obstruction if the mass becomes large, and then that can result in um, blockage of the bile duct uh, and patients becoming jaundiced. Uh, the tumor can also grow into the duodenum uh, in, uh, and ulcerate and cause bleeding, uh, and it often will obstruct the pancreatic duct as well. And, this shows uh, kind of a normal looking pancreas. Typically, once you have a mass in the head of the pancreas, uh, by the time that the mass becomes large enough, it's obstructed the pancreatic duct and the pancreas shrivels or atrophies uh, and becomes quite small. So again, the cl typical clinical presentation can be painless jaundice where, they, where the patients just turn yellow, uh, dark urine and light stool, and these are all a direct result of obstruction of the common bile duct. Uh, abdominal pain, uh, mainly in the mid-abdomen uh, with radiation to the back. Uh, occasionally, patients present with pancreatitis, which is inflammation of the pancreas due to obstruction of the pancreatic duct. Uh, a lot of these patients present with unintentional weight loss, and um, uh, that's because uh, these tumors uh, increase metabolic activity uh, and um, oftentimes with weight loss, we'll do a CT scan and find a mass. Uh, patients often also have loss of appetite. And um, since patients are getting more and more CAT scans uh, for uh, various reasons, sometimes they can be incidental findings on imaging tests. And that's, that's kind of the ideal way because they're, they're presenting before they're symptomatic and hopefully at a smaller uh, time point. So in order to diagnose pancreatic cancer, it typically requires uh, imaging of some sort, uh, and 
One can do either cross-sectional imaging with CT or MR, MRI, but to confirm the diagnosis, you generally need to get tissue, and uh, it's often done either by CT-guided, ultrasound-guided, uh, and more recently and more frequently, endoscopic ultrasound-guided fine needle aspiration, uh, and occasionally by uh, endo endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography and getting brushings and biopsies. But the reason that, e um, I'll actually get to that on another slide. That in terms of uh, pancreatic cancers and where they uh, are located, and this is relevant uh, to focused ultrasound uh, because of acoustic windows, a majority occur in the pancreatic head. 75% occur in the pancreatic head, with 15% occurring in the body of the pancreas and 10% occurring in the ta tail of the pancreas. The tail of the pancreas is very difficult to get at with uh, focused ultrasound because it it lies underneath the spleen and uh, behind the rib cage. So uh, that's a very challenging target. The body is the ideal target. It has the least amount of bowel intervening, uh, and uh, it's a, an easy target to hit for focused ultrasound. Uh, the head can be challenging because it's near the duodenal wall, uh, and so it's closer to bowel gas. But it's also a reasonable target, uh, depending on the approach that you take. Um, in terms of... Uh, Diagnostic tools, why do we do it? We want to know exactly where the lesion is, uh, and then we want to uh, tissue, obtain tissue for it to confirm pathologically the diagnosis. And we do staging, and the staging is important because it helps us to determine the prognosis for the patient, and it directs management, um, whether or not the patient is a candidate for surgery, should the patient have chemotherapy, uh, should we consider other interventions, uh, and also eligibility for clinical trials uh, is determined by diagnosis. Uh, when um, diagnosing and staging uh, pancreatic cancer, we use the TNM staging, which stand, the T stands for the tumor, primary tumor, uh, and it's usually on a T1 through 4 scale. Uh, the significance of this is T3, uh, they're very common. Uh, they extend beyond the pancreas, but do not involve the celiac or SMA, uh, whereas T4 tumors involve the celiac axis or the superior mesenteric artery. These are uh, uh, unresectable tumors because of vascular involvement, and this is a very common presentation as T4. And then you have the N stands for lymph node staging, so either presence of regional lymph nodes or uh, zero is no regional lymph nodes, N1 is uh, positive regional lymph nodes. One thing uh, to note about pancreatic cancer is it metastasizes early. so. Then more often than not, you do have regional lymph node metastasis early on in the disease. And then distant metastasis, pancreatic cancer right now is considered a systemic disease because they also almost always present with distant metastasis. Sometimes we can't identify it, but essentially oncologists assume that these tumors have some uh, uh, distant metastasis, uh, but that's given a zero or a one. And, and then we put all this together to come up with the, the actual stage. Uh, and the stage predicts uh, your prognosis. Uh, stage three and stage four are ones that are not considered resectable. Stage three, again, is the one that involves the celiac artery or the superior mesenteric artery. Uh, and then stage four is metastatic disease. Uh, so right now, most studies that have been done using focused ultrasound involve stage three and stage four, primarily for palliation, uh, because these are not surgical candidates. Um, uh, we can use transabdominal imaging, uh, transabdominal ultrasound to image, again, CT, MRI, MRCP, ERCP, endoscopic ultrasound, or PET, and I'll show you examples of some of these. Um, transabdominal ultrasound uh, is often underutilized in this, um, uh, but it's non-invasive and it's relatively inexpensive. It's easy to perform, and it's particularly useful if we're thinking about doing um, uh, focused ultrasound treatment because it's the same kind of energy that we would treat the tumor with. And if you can visualize the tumor with transabdominal ultrasound, you can probably target it with focused ultrasound. And so this is an example of a tumor that's in the body of the pancreas. This is the liver right here. Here's the abdominal wall. And there's actually a minimal bowel intervening. So this is like the ideal candidate for a patient who would be treated with focused ultrasound. Um, the problem is that um, uh, it limit, it's limited in detail, it's often operator dependent, uh, and it may, it may be sufficient if there's metastatic disease that's uh, identified. 
CT is kind of the standard of care. It's the primary modality for evaluating pancreatic tumors. Um, the resolution has been improving. Uh, the only issue is it requires IV contrast, which means that you have to have normal kidney function. Again, here's an image of a pancreatic mass involving the celiac artery. This is a T4 tumor with encasement of the celiac artery. Um, just out of reference, this is the liver, the gallbladder, um, teen, uh, kidney, and spine. Uh, some typical findings on T CT scan, you often see a hypodense pancreatic mass, so there's the, the you can see the subtle, the, the subtle hypodense mass here, and what really gives it away is there's uh, upstream pancreatic duct dilation, so that, that suggests an obstruction uh, downstream. And again, um, also you might have uh, bile duct dilation. This is a coronal image. Uh, this is the, the bile duct. This is an enlarged gallbladder suggesting obstruction by a mass. Here you have the mass, and then you also have narrowing of the portal vein. So this, this mass is essentially encasing the portal vein. Uh, here's a couple more images. Here's a, a hypodense mass here in the, the body of the, the pancreas, again with an enlarged gallbladder dilated pancreatic duct right there. Uh, and then here's another mass. This is the celiac artery. This is the superior mesenteric artery. This is the aorta. So you can see that the mass is encasing these vessels. So that's a T4 tumor. Uh, MRI and MRCP, also highly relevant for uh, our discussion on high-intensity focus ultrasound. This is indicated in patients uh, who have contraindications to uh, CT scan. However, this also has contraindications. So if you have implanted devices or foreign bodies such as pacemakers and implanted electronic devices, aneurysmal clips, cochlear implants, uh, or claustrophobia, um, having an MRI or MRCP um, is uh, somewhat contraindicated. This is an example of an MRCP showing uh, the liver and the, uh, this is the bile duct, this is the pancreatic duct, uh, and that's essentially a normal examination. ERCP is a test uh, that I do. This is an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography where we go in with a scope um, and we cannulate the major papilla. Uh, this is where the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct uh, uh, join to drain into the uh, duodenum. We can inject contrast in there and uh, basically with fluoroscopy uh, define the ductal anatomy. So this that's uh, normal. Uh, and I'll show you an abnormal uh, image in a little bit. Um, I also do endoscopic ultrasound. So this uh, is often done to stage, uh, stage to determine resectability. It's particularly good for small lesions uh, and uh, to assess vascular involvement. But the main reason that we use this is for tissue diagnosis. To, you know, we do fine needle aspiration. Uh, and this is also being investigated as a potential screening modality in high-risk uh, individuals because ultrasound actually has the highest resolution of any of the imaging um, technologies. Uh, but again, this is highly operator dependent and somewhat invasive. It requires an endoscopic procedure. But this is what US FNA is, and this kind of uh, cartoon really shows nicely the proximity of the stomach to the pancreas. So the, 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 the pancreas and the stomach are basically just separated by the wall of the stomach. And so it's uh, very easy to get access. This is the closest structure to get access to these tumors. And so this is the favored way to get tissue right now because the needle only has to traverse through the, the wall of the stomach as opposed to through the entire body. Uh, so we routinely do FNA to diagnose pancreatic cancer. And this is um, just a, a video to show you uh, what we do. So it's a, a back and forth motion once we get into the mass. This is actually an enlarged lymph node that we're uh, sampling here. And then uh, we collect the cells, and cytology or uh, histology can be used to, to diagnose uh, the mass. And it's a pretty straightforward procedure. And people are actually looking at this as a modality to deliver therapy as well through the needle. We can either inject uh, something or deliver electrocautery. But again, that requires a needle puncture and is somewhat invasive. Uh, and I'll get to why HIFU has benefits. And lastly, in terms of imaging, there's uh, PET imaging. So this is based on glucose metabolism. The entire body's imaged. It might be useful in uh, uh, detecting dis distant metastasis, and it's also useful in ass assessing response to therapy. So this is an example of a PET image with a, a, a pancreatic mass that's lighting up. 
Uh, here's another uh, image. So here's, again, a CT scan. It's a little bit hard to see the lesion here, but it lights up nicely on the, the PET-fused image, uh, PET-CT fused image. Uh, and then here's another example where um, you can see this is a primary tumor and it identifies a metastatic focus in, in the liver. So this is good kind of to, it doesn't have the highest resolution, but it gives you a good whole body image and it's uh, gives you some functional information in terms of uh, metabolic activity. This is another example of a patient who has two metastatic foci in the liver on, on PET imaging. So in terms of current therapies for pancreatic cancer, ideally if it's detected early enough, uh, stage one or two disease, surgical resection is an option. Again, most patients don't present uh, early enough to perform surgical resection. So for those patients who uh, surgery isn't an option or we want to give additional therapy, chemotherapy is administered. Currently, it's either gemcitabine-based therapy uh, with a couple additional agents or um, uh, fulfirinox, which is uh, fluorouracil, leucovorin, arenotecan, and oxaliplatin. Those are considered first-line agents. Um, also, radiotherapy, um, uh, including stereotactic uh, radiotherapy, is being investigated. There's no consensus on the role of radiotherapy, and it kind of varies from center to center. Our center actually does uh, a considerable amount of radiotherapy, but um, uh, it's not uniformly uh, part of standard therapy. There are many novel therapies that are being uh, uh, developed, uh, stromal targeting, immunotherapy, um, but these are all investigational and, and clinical trials. And then probably the, the most therapy that we de deliver has to do with palliation. Um, and one of the palliative therapies that we do uh, endoscopically is a celiac plexus neurolysis. This actually, um, we inject alcohol uh, into the celiac uh, plexus which uh, basically transmits all the pain fibers from the, from the tumor, and this helps to decrease uh, pain and decrease narcotic requirements. But the problem with this is, one, again, it's somewhat invasive, and two, um, it doesn't treat the primary tumor. Um, I do this procedure, but um, you know, from, from uh, um, kind of a medical care standpoint, I would prefer to do a treatment that actually treats the tumor because then I think we're advancing the field. Um, uh, my oncology colleagues and those oncologists who might be out there on the web, I know you all think that this is a systemic disease. My response to that is, as uh, soon as you find a nice systemic therapy in terms of chemotherapy, then local disease is gonna be very important. So I think this works in parallel. Uh, and um, there, I, I feel strongly that there'll be an, uh, a need for local therapy uh, in the near future. So. That gets us to high flu. That's a background on pancreatic cancer, and the rest of this we'll be talking about uh, the role of uh, focused ultrasound. So the benefit of focused ultrasound, it is truly non-invasive um, at this point. Uh, it's extracorporeal, meaning that we approach this from outside of the body going in. This is just a cartoon depiction um, of a, a focused ultrasound transducer. This is an ultrasound-guided um, embodiment, so we have an imaging transducer in the center. Uh, and what this does is um, the beam can be targeted uh, on the lesion and typical size of uh, um, focused ultrasound transducers results in a lesion that's about the size of a grain of rice, 10 millimeters in length, 3 millimeters in width. This can be adjusted. We have now uh, electronic steering available. Um, we can change the, the dimensions of the focus. So this is, this is just for a fixed focus embodiment, but it gets the concept across. One thing that is necessary is there needs to be a way to couple the ultrasound to the body. It can't propagate through air very well, uh, so we usually have a, a water coupling bath that couples um, uh, the sound uh, from the transducer to the body. Uh, but once in the body, if, as long as you don't have bone or air, uh, ultrasound transmits uh, very nicely through the body. Uh, this is just an example for those who aren't uh, very familiar with HIFU. Um, HIFU exerts a considerable amount of radiation force. So this is just the surface where the, the focus was put on the surface of water and shows you the ability to jet. That's called radiation force. And then this is um, on a piece of plexiglass, and this will show you um, what a, a typical lesion uh, will look like. So it's a little round lesion uh, in cross-section that can melt plastic. And you saw that that took just a couple seconds uh, to achieve. So imagine that propagating through your body uh, and hitting the target. 
we can um, we can essentially ablate uh, virtually any structure in the body. Haifu has been around for quite some time, actually. Um, uh, many people don't realize that the first application of ultrasound back in you know the 20s and 30s, uh, and we're talking 1920s, is for therapeutic purposes. That um, it was actually used more for therapeutic purposes before it was used for diagnostic imaging. Um, the Chinese have developed uh, several clinical systems uh, that are ultrasound guided. Um, this is an example of uh, a device that was made in Beijing. This is a device made in Chongqing, a device made in Shanghai. They're all pretty similar. They use ultrasound to target, um, but that's about it. Um, uh, they're all essentially fixed focus systems. Uh, this is a newer device. I'd call this almost a second generation device um, out of a company in Korea where it um, has a transducer. Uh, and the reason I consider it second generation, one, the, the transducer has a phased array. It's a multi-element phased array. And then the, the imaging probe has, or their imaging system has the ability to do some monitoring. And that's, uh, that's an important area to develop in order for ultrasound-guided high food to progress. Um, the other area, um, the other form of monitoring is MR. Uh, and MR has uh, significant benefits over ultrasound in that one can do uh, real-time temperature measurements using MR thermometry. And so that really helps to uh, truly guide therapy uh, as opposed to uh, just target. We can monitor the therapy as it's occurring in real time. It increases the level of safety. It knows. It, it helps to know that we're effectively getting the energy to the target. Um, it's a lot of technology, though, and it's much, much more expensive than the ultrasound-guided systems. But this is, you know, this is what is being used in the U.S. Um, this is a approved device uh, in Saytech out of Israel. Um, this is actually approved in the U.S. for uh, uh, treatment of uterine fibroids and bone metastasis. This is the Philips system. Um, uh, it's undergoing clinical trials in the U.S. and is approved uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, the benefit of the Philips system right now is they're able to do uh, hyperthermia, not just ablation, uh, whereas the Insight Tech system is primarily uh, for ablative therapies. So here's an example of a patient um, who was treated with um, focused ultrasound. Uh, I think I showed you this image before. Here's the tumor. Uh, it's encasing the celiac artery. Uh, and then this is six months after uh, focused ultrasound therapy. You can see that this is a non-perfuse volume, uh, and this area has been successfully ablated. Uh, and it's also six months after therapy, so we know that the patient at least survived six months. So that's significant as well. Um, there are several studies that have been reported. Most of them uh, initially were all out of China. You can see that the first, and, and there are many, many more than this. These are just uh, representative studies, but you know the first four that I mentioned uh, in the early 2000s were all out of China. Uh, they all looked at just using hypo monotherapy, so not in conjunction with chemotherapy. Their main outcome was looking at pain relief, and you can see that um, they had pain relief in 80 to 95 percent of cases and uh, minor adverse events, so mild pancreatitis, one pseudocyst, and one grade two skin burn. So this was all data out of China. Uh, we didn't really know what to make of it, but you know, I had been to China and observed many of these uh, treatments, uh, and um, I do feel that they were very genuine. I spoke to the patients, and um, most of them weren't sedated, uh, and uh, they, they did achieve pain relief. Um, starting in 2011, we started to see data outside of China. So the first ones were out of Korea that also did monotherapy and showed a decrease in pain score uh, from uh, 4.9 to 2.1. They had some more complications. They had a pancreatic duct fistula, uh, pancreatic duodenal fistula, some skin burns, a minor GI bleed. Um, and then uh, uh, Sofuni out of uh, Tokyo uh, Medical University in Tokyo um, reported 30 patients with hypomonotherapy. He's, I understand he's up to about 200 patients now or over 200 patients. Again, seeing some pain relief um, and some clinical benefit. Uh, this is an aggregate score of uh, weight gain and pain relief and quality of life. Again, some mild complications. And then um, uh, Juan Vidal Jovi uh, out of Spain uh, a couple of years ago, presented some very impressive uh, data on his cohort of patients 
or he treated with them with both hypo and chemotherapy uh, and had a significant survival at uh, 4.2 years. And I'm going to show you this data in particular. So this is very intriguing data. He treated 36 patients, stage 3 and stage 4 uh, disease. And um, if you recall my beginning introduction slides, um, I said the average five-year survival was only 8%. Well, in his study, um, at almost five years, he had 33.5% survival. Um, now, this is not a randomized controlled trial. This wasn't even a comparative trial, so there's likely to be, you know, selection bias uh, introduced into this. But, um, you know, I, what this tells me is if you're selected to to be in to be treated by high food, you had actually a good chance of uh, surviving five years. So, you know, whatever the selection criteria were. Um, uh, it, it portended a good survival benefit. So the, the real key to this is we need a good comparative study to, to see, uh, to compare similar patients to see whether or not HIPU really is having a uh, um, uh, significant impact on the disease process. But there are many biological reasons that I'll get into in a little bit that suggest that this might be real, um, but it does, it does warrant further investigation. Um, so this kind of brings me to um, one thing that the Focus Ultrasound Foundation um, uh, has de decided to uh, participate in. They've, uh, they have uh, agreed to sponsor a pancreatic cancer registry of patients treated with Focus Ultrasound. And we're just getting the study up and running. Um, we uh, have not finalized the protocol yet, but uh, we know that we're going to look at uh, primary outcomes of uh, pain palliation, objective response, progression-free survival, overall survival, impact on quality of life, and uh, potentially re immune response. Uh, we're evaluating clinical sites right now. So if you are someone who's treating patients with pancreatic cancer with either MR or ultrasound-guided focus ultrasound, please contact us, uh, and uh, we would uh, uh, love the opportunity to see if uh, you would like to participate in this uh, registry study. The steering committee um, includes myself, Franco Orsi, Peggy, uh, Gahuni, Alessandro Napoli out of Italy, Juan, Juan Vidal Jove, and then Jay Young Lee out of Korea. And again, it's sponsored by the Focused Ultrasound Foundation. We appreciate the sponsorship and the organization. Um, the next part of this talk, I just wanted to get into um, some, uh, what I think is really the future of uh, focused ultrasound uh, applications in pancreas. Um, ablation, you know, there, there are many ways to ablate uh, tumors, but ultrasound, uh, focused ultrasound has some very unique properties that um, no other uh, technology actually uh, can provide. Uh, and when I go around talking to uh, graduate students and postdocs and those uh, who are entering this field, I really encourage them to focus on these areas that are, are unique. Um, and they really have to do with the mechanical effects uh, of HIFU uh, and uh, namely cavitation. Um, also with drug delivery, uh, there are temperature sensitive liposomes that are being, in, uh, that are being developed. Um, and uh, again, uh, some of these devices are capable of de de delivering uh, constant hyperthermia to large areas of the tumor, and we can use that to enhance drug delivery, and I'll show you some uh, cl preclinical data on that. So it, when we're thinking of drug delivery, we have to realize that these are systemically administered uh, drugs. So they're given IV, they're not given locally. Um, we want to be able to give them intravascularly, uh, and that means that these tumors are dependent on the vascular system, of, you know, or the, the delivery of these drugs are dependent on the vascular system and the vascularity of these tumors. Pancreatic cancer is a unique tumor in that it is actually, um, we consider this to be a hypovascular, so it's not really well vascularized, uh, and uh, it has high intratumoral pressures which prevent drug from penetrating, and it also has a significant amount of uh, what we call interstitial fibrosis, uh, which basically creates another, yet another barrier uh, to drug delivery. And so we think that this is what, these are the reasons why pancreatic um, cancers are so resistant to chemotherapy. Um, and, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, animal studies. So a lot of these drugs that we've used in clinically have been highly effective in uh, mouse models and in vitro. They're, they, you know, they, det they uh, have tumoricidal activity. 
Um, they work great uh, in cell culture. They work great even in mouse models. So xenograft mouse models, which are human pancreatic ca cancer cells that are injected either under the skin or into the pancreas of mice. Um, you also have allograft, which are mouse pancreatic cancer cells lines. These are relatively new. Um, they can be, again, injected uh, under the skin or into the pancreas, which would be orthotopic. Um, we also have better genetically engineered models, and I'll talk a bit about that. I think that genetically engineered models are very important for studying drug delivery because these have tumors that have their own vascular system. So the xenograft and the allograft are somewhat artificial, and they don't develop a vascular system that is actually similar to uh, real tumors because they grow so rapidly. So they actually are very well vascularized, whereas the genetically engineered tumors um, exhibit similar vascularity to human disease where they are hypoperfused, uh, there's a positive vessels. Uh, and so this is probably the better model or the most ideal model to study drug delivery. So this is an example of a xenograft where the histo histopathology differs markedly from that of a human cancer. Uh, human pancreatic cancer, uh, primarily due to a lack of stroman. I'll show you some images of that. It also lacks an immune system, uh, and so we don't. We're, there's no uh, opportunity to assess uh, for an immune response. And so this is a, an example of a subcutaneously injected uh, tumor visualized on MR. Uh, an allograft. It has somewhat similar histopathology to human pancreatic cancer, and its benefit is also that we use a mouse that, since we're using mouse cell lines. Uh, we're, use, we're able to use it in a mouse who's not immune compromised. So we might be able to get at some uh, immune questions in, in an allograft model, but probably not ideal for drug delivery studies, again, because of the vascularity. The pancreatic tumor models, um, uh, uh, in terms of the genetically engineered ones, the one that we use in our lab is uh, one that has uh, uh, the genetic mutations that are seen in human pancreatic cancer, which is a KRAS mutation and a P53 mutation. And these develop clinical symptoms very similar to uh, human disease. Uh, they metastasize similar to human disease. And the histopathology found in these are very similar to human uh, disease. And this is an example of a tumor that is developed in a mouse, uh, in a genetically engineered mouse. These are probably the most ideal mice to uh, do drug delivery studies in because they have uh, similar vascular uh, vascularity to uh, human disease. And this is this is what I was talking about. So this is um, uh, this is um, an example of the fibrosis. So there's extensive fibrosis that you can see uh, surrounding a nest of tumor cells, and the vessels that are supplying them are outside of this nest. And so um, the, there's also higher intratumoral pressure. And so the drug has to get out here across the stromal barrier and enter um, this nest of cells. Uh, and also, um, because of this fibrosis, um, this is from a review out of Scientific American, but it's a beautiful picture. This is the, the interstitial fibrosis that it's seen. You can see how it can pinch um, these blood vessels, uh, and that decreases delivery of drug into the tumor. And again, here's the stromal barrier. So even if drug gets out, it has to cross this very dense barrier in order to get to tumor. There are some drugs that are being looked at to, de uh, to basically deplete the stroma uh, in hopes that this will open up these vessels and allow the drug to penetrate. We've actually also done some ultrasound studies to disrupt this uh, mechanically, and we've demonstrated that we're able to deliver more drug to the tumor, and I'll show images of that in just a minute. So this is the histology of uh, some pancreatic cancer. This is out of uh, Olive's uh, um, article in Science in 2009. This is a very significant paper. Um, this is an example of a transplanted uh, mouse model. You can see it's um, very well vascularized. You can see the blood vessel, and this is all tumor. Uh, there's no stroma. The stroma is shown in blue. So this is human uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, and you can see this uh, dense stroma, and these are the pancreatic uh, cancer cells, and then the v blood vessels you can't even see because they're squeezed, they're pinched in between uh, this fibrous stroma. And this is what the transgenic mouse model looks like. So you can see that this also has a fibrous stroma, not quite as dense as this, but um, it, it exists. And actually, in our data, this is our 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 uh, histology slides. This is normal pancreas, um, just normal glands. 
this is the KPC mouse, so this is a genetic mouse model. You can see, you know, dense fibrosis. There's a lot of bands of fibrosis and then just nests of uh, tumor cells in here. Uh, this is the orthotopic model. Uh, so just wisp of fiber, uh, fibrous stroma, but for the most part, you know, it's just packed with uh, tumor. And then this is the subcutaneous model, you know, almost no uh, fibrous stroma as well. Uh, and then if we go to the next image, this shows the vascularity of it. So this is a, a fluorescence image of the vessels. You can see in the KPC mouse that there are areas that essentially have no vessels, whereas in the orthotopic model, there's uh, plenty of vessels supplying this tumor. In the subcutaneous model, uh, there's vessels you know, all over the place. So uh, I think this, this uh, goes to show that you, you need to be careful in terms of what model you look at when you're doing preclinical studies to look at drug delivery. And so this was some uh, work that uh, uh, Tong Lee did, my uh, graduate student, uh, where we uh, took tumors and we basically uh, tried to uh, cavitate them. So we are not ablating them. Uh, we did this in a, uh, using an um, uh, ultrasound system, a small animal ultrasound system, and targeted the pancreas, and we just do spot treatments, and uh, we did uh, our uh, initial study using fluorescein, which was a marker. This is a similar size to, um, to gemcitabine in terms of size, uh, and you can see that in the tumor um, with fibrosis, this is a sham. We got no leakages of, leakage of fluorescein, but in the pulsed hyphu uh, treated animal, this is all, you know, dense fibrosis, and you can see that we were able to get fluorescein uh, to leak into the stroma and to the to the tumor cell. So the tumor's right here, and this is really lighting up with uh, with the fluorescein. So this um, is what uh, this is some of the data that helped us to get an NIH grant uh, to study this, and we subsequently uh, went on to demonstrate that um, it's cavitation uh, that is. Um, causing, uh, that's enhancing the drug delivery. Basically, all this shows is that um, if we go to higher pressure, we get more cavitation, and if we get more cavitation, we get uh, increased drug delivery. Uh, and so uh, we determined that we, we need to monitor for cavitation. And this is, again, some multispectral imaging showing control tissue up here with minimal fluorescence. This is uh, Dr. Ruberson that we're imaging here. And then this is the area that we treated with pulsed uh, focused ultrasound, and you can see um, uh, penetration of drug in that treated area. And this is the histology, and this basically shows the disruption of the stroma. So you can see that the, this is mechanically disrupted. It's, it's not thermally ablated. It's mechanically disrupted regions in the stroma. Uh, and this is the, the trichrome stain showing the fibrosis. But then on the left is, is actually the really important side. This is Dr. Ruberson. This is showing where the docs go. So the, over here is the tumor uh, tissue. This was the fibrosis. And so we're getting docs into the tumor. Uh, and I don't have the, the control here, but in the control basically is just black. We get no drug in. So um, uh, we're able to demonstrate a significant increase in penetration of drug. And we determined that this is based on cavitation. So um, the other project that Tong Lee worked on was trying to image cavitation uh, because we really can't see cavitation on current modes of uh, uh, ultrasound imaging. And we'd like to be able to use this under ultrasound guidance mainly for uh, long-term cost applications. Uh, and um, she was able to demonstrate by using a method called interleaving Doppler, uh, which kind of com combines color Doppler and pulse inversion Doppler that we're able to detect cavitation at relatively low pressure. So this is when peak negative pressures are at 1.9 megapascal. So this is a promising technology, and you know, we're still working on this. But if we're able to develop this, then we'll be able to monitor um, uh, our, our tissue effect uh, with ultrasound imaging. Moving on to mild hyperthermia, this is where we want to elevate temperature uh, of the tissue to 40 to 45 degrees. And mild, we all we know that uh, hyperthermia. Hyperthermia has been around forever, and we know that uh, it increases blood flow, it enhances vascular permeability. It also is a radio sensitizer, uh, um, and so uh, it has many benefits. Uh, and this can be achieved by focused ultrasound under MR, MRI monitoring and control. 
And um, why would we want to do that? If we had an, a drug, a temperature-sensitive liposome, uh, like Thermodox, which is undergoing clinical trials, this is a drug that is a temperature-sensitive liposome that's loaded with doxorubicin, and it releases its cargo at 41 degrees C. And so the benefit is of this is doxorubicin can have systemic toxicity. And so if we're able to administer um, the same dose or even a lower dose but get higher concentrations in the tumor, we'll have greater therapeutic, uh, a greater therapeutic window and potentially greater efficacy because dosing of doxorubicin right now is limited by toxicity. And the concept is, you know, you have a tumor and theoretically has somewhat leaky vessels uh, and then you uh, administer this systemically, you add heat, and then the heat will release the payload uh, only in the area uh, that you've targeted. And here, this is kind of a, it's a bit of a commercial movie. It was made by uh, both Celsius and um, Philips uh, several years ago. But this is, this is an example of what this uh, temperature sensitive liposome is. It's loaded with doxorubers, and this gives it scale. So you see red blood cells, it's much, much smaller than the size of a red blood cell, uh, it's in the you know 50 to 100 nanometer size. The concept is if you had a target, you heat that target while administering um, the uh, temperature sensitive liposome with the chemotherapeutic agent, and by heating it, um, it will then release the payload here, and then it will then um, act on the the local tumor cell. So the thought is you get higher concentration. Uh, with lower toxic systemic toxicity. And so um, this was very appealing uh, to us. Um, we decided to investigate this uh, using an MR-guided system. This is the Philips Sonoleave, and they had a dedicated four-channel small animal coil that allowed us to do mouse studies. Uh, and this was funded uh, uh, generously by the Focused Ultrasound Foundation um, uh, on a grant many years ago. It took us a while to complete because uh, it's hard to treat mice in, in a, a large magnet using a human system, but we can do it. Um, this is an MR image of uh, a mouse pancreatic tumor, and this is a temperature map, and we just recently had this accepted for publication uh, in the International Journal of Hyperthermia, so hopefully it'll be published uh, in not too long. Uh, but this demonstrates that we're able to target and then control the temperature in this area. And when we do this, uh, we were able to demonstrate that we could get up to uh, a 16-fold increase in drug delivery. Uh, th this has a wide disparity, and we think that this is somewhat an experimental error, and we think that it lives a little bit higher here. And a lot of other, other investigators have been um, evaluating this in other models, not pancreatic cancer, but uh, typically uh, they get over a 10-fold increase in drug delivery using uh, the temperature-sensitive liposome plus heat. Uh, if we just administer the temperature-sensitive liposome without any uh, heat, basically uh, non-detectable in the tumor, and this is all based on HPLC data. Uh, and then we also looked at um, this in orthotopic models, and we get some increased drug, del drug delivery, but not as substantial uh, as the uh, the KPC mouse. Um, and then we also looked at free doxorubicin, uh, and we, we knew that we would get some increase in delivery with hyperthermia because it increases vascular flow um, and makes the uh, capillaries a little bit more leaky. So we did see that, uh, but there was a, and there was a significant difference, but still with the um, uh, thermodox, we got substantially higher uh, drug concentrations in the tumor. And I want to show you some uh, representative uh, uh, results. So over here is the control uh, tissue, uh, and you can basically see that uh, there is uh, no uh, drug delivery. Um, in here you can barely see the red. This is, these are the vessels, and then uh, the green represents doxorubicin. Uh, and then over here, uh, this is the treated, so this is temperature-sensitive liposome with hyperthermia. And you can just see uh, how much penetration of uh, drug uh, we get uh, in this scenario. Uh, so it was quite dramatic. And I think that this, this really is, um, uh, if it weren't for the regulatory barriers, uh, this is something that I think has Im immense pro uh, promise. The problem is, we know, the regulatory barriers um, 
prevent, make, make a drug device comp combination very, very challenging. And that's essentially what this is. It's going to be a new drug with a new device. Uh, and um, I, I hope that we'll be able to find a way to overcome this barrier because I think that this really has great potential to help patients. If you want to learn more about this, um, just uh, just a couple weeks ago, um, uh, there was this paper out of Holger Rules Group, who I think you know they do some of the best work in this area. Uh, they published in PNAS on thermal combination therapies for local drug delivery by magnetic resonance guided high intensity focused ultrasound. This is in other models, so this isn't in pancreas, but um, he does he has an amazing lab. Uh, and does some great work, and this is a very excellent paper that I'd recommend uh, reading if you're more interested uh, in this topic. So um, just kind of going on to the last part of this talk, additional advances uh, in uh, focused ultrasound. Uh, I want to briefly talk about a concept of boiling hypsotripsy. Again, a very unique uh, bioeffect that uh, we only see with ultrasound. Um, the, the concept of focused ultrasound stimulated immune response, which uh, is uh, booming, uh, very intriguing, and also to briefly discuss endoscopic HIFU, which I think is very relevant for pancreatic applications. So um, boiling histotripsy, and there are other methods of histotripsy, but the bottom line is it's a method of tissue lysis, mechanical tissue lysis, without thermal effect. And this is work of uh, um, uh, uh, Tony Koklova, who used to be a postdoc with me and is now an independent investigator at the University of Washington. but. She, you know, she does some great work on histotripsy and has demonstrated the ability to, you know, create uh, cavitation in vivo. Uh, and um, she uses a method of boiling histotripsy, where you do just do short millisecond pulses, uh, and but you do multiple repetitions of this, and then you end up getting uh, cell lysis, and basically you lyse this. The benefit of this is you don't denature the protein. They've done assays on this, and the proteins remain intact. Um, the cells are lysed, but the proteins are intact, which I think um, has uh, uh, significance, especially for uh, doing biomarker analysis and also for immune response. Uh, and so this is um, uh, an image. The nice thing about histotripsy is you can image it with current BMO technology. This is ultrasound. You, know, you can see the bubbles. These are big bubbles. And so this is where uh, the, the histotripsy is occurring, and this is in a a mouse model, and so this is the tumor before and this is after, so we don't get skin breakdown, there's no burns. And then you can see um, on histology that this is a very uh, a, a lysed area, so it looks all uh, coagulated. It's not necrose, it's, or it's necrose, but there's no coagulation in terms of thermal coagulation. And there's a very discreet margin between the treatment and the um, uh, the treated area and the untreated area. And they've demonstrated this in uh, pig livers as well. So I think that the, there's a lot of interest in this particular technology. They're able to demonstrate that they can get lesions in pig livers uh, in vivo. Uh, and, and so why is this uh, important? So if we do histotripsy, that leaves intact protein. And one can think that um, by doing histotripsy, you release antigens and also create a danger signal that leads to T cell activation proliferation uh, and activation of CD8 uh, cytotoxic C cells, T cells that then impact regulatory T cells, and that um, hopefully will switch the balance of this to more stimulation of the immune response. And this again is also work by Tanya Kaklova in our lab. Uh, and so there's some clinical data to support this, right? And that's called the Ebscopal effect. And this was presented at last year's Focus to Ultrasound Foundation Symposium. Uh, this is work from uh, Franco Orsi, uh, where he showed uh, in certain patients he could treat the tumor, and um, after some time he would get this abscopal effect, where here you have some lymph nodes that are involved with tumor, and then after, um, this is after 18 months, one, this patient survived 18 months, so that's also significant, but two, the lymph nodes are gone. So the, very intriguing because he didn't ablate the lymph nodes, but after ablating the tumor, he got a regression of the lymph nodes. So, um, in four of 46 patients that he treated in follow that had follow-up imaging, he saw uh, shrinkage in metastasis in, in sites that he didn't treat, so in retroperitoneal lymph nodes, liver, and lung. So this is very intriguing, uh, hypothesis-generating stuff, and one, can, one probably has to invoke the immune system and uh, immune response uh, in terms of getting that effect. So this is kind of a complex slide that um, one of my fellows 
drew up for a review that we recently wrote, uh, but this basically shows various areas that ultrasound could potentially impact uh, the immune system. So here's the example of a homogenized neoantigen that gets presented to dendritic cells, um, potentially doing sonoporation. Uh, hyperthermia can increase chemotherapy and radiosensitivity. Uh, so there's all these multiple mechanisms that uh, focus ultrasound in particular because of, mainly because of mechanical effects, can impact the immune system. So I think this is a major focus of investigation going into the future. And so lastly, um, EOS guided uh, focused ultrasound. Um, I bring this up in part because I'm a gastroenterologist and I always have to bring it back to endoscopy somehow. Um, but it's relevant for pancreatic tumors because they're often inaccessible by extracorporeal ultrasound. And one of the criti criticisms of extracorporeal ultrasound is that we can't target a lot of these tumors. And so um, if we do it endoscopically guided, uh, we can almost target everything. Um, these tumors are deep in the abdomen. They often have bowel and bone intervening. There's respiratory motion. But um, endoscopically, I've shown that it, um, you can get right adjacent to the tumor. So. We've, I've been working on this uh, for about a decade. This is our second prototype. Uh, it includes uh, endobronchial ultrasound probe for imaging. This is a fixed crystal uh, uh, that focuses. Um, we developed water channels and balloon channels. This is what the prototype actually looks like in, in real life. And we've done some animal studies on this. This is, some, this is a gel phantom where we can show that we can see a hyper echo. You, know, you can see uh, the radiation force causing this to bounce all over the place, but here's the lesion. Um, one thing that's important is that ultrasound isn't great, it doesn't perfectly depict the lesion because the lesion actually goes further, but you can't really see it on ultrasound. Again, that's a flaw of ultrasound and we need to work on better imaging methods uh, to, to perfect that. But this shows, this is a pancreas right here. This is um, after ablation uh, and this is uh, the lesion. Uh, um, in vivo after after we've uh, completed it. So the flaw of that is that it's a fixed focus um, design and uh, it can't get to all regions of the pancreas. This is work out of Chris Diedrich's lab. Uh, the, he presented this also at the Focused Ultrasound Foundation uh, Symposium last year and this was when I saw this, I thought this was genius. Uh, and so he has an endoscope uh, and this is at this, this thing is actually a, le a lens that can uh, be adjusted, uh, and a, a reflector and a lens that can be adjusted and that basically allows for you to get more energy in this embodiment. Uh, it's a larger aperture which means that you can uh, ablate at deeper depths and this can actually be adjusted so that you can treat different uh, depths. So this is a project that he and I hope to work on together. Um, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to advance uh, that concept as well. So um, in conclusion, ablation for pancreatic cancer is effective for palliation of pain and we need to investigate this further and we're planning on investigating clinical outcomes in a prospective study in a registry study, prospective registry study uh, sponsored by the foundation. Um, ablation is unlikely to be sufficient for complete local control because can't pancreatic cancer is this considered to be a systemic disease. But if we can um, do uh, histotripsy, then it might be a systemic therapy by uh, 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 upregulating the immune system and uh, enhancing immune therapy. And I also think that uh, drug delivery is very promising as well, either hyperthermia or mechanical, uh, and warrants uh, further investigation. I actually think our preclinical, the preclinical results that exist already warrant moving into clinical therapy. And um, uh, there's a group in Europe funded by uh, the European Union that's looking to move that forward. So uh, I'm hoping to see clinical trials of that quite soon. Uh, and again, our registry, uh, prospective registry is in preparation. So uh, with that, um, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, all our, my many collaborators. We have a large lab uh, of, of uh, past and present uh, people who've worked there, uh, others at uh, the University of Washington uh, and other collaborators that have helped. Uh, this requires a lot of collaboration. I'm sure I forgot some people. If I have and you're listening, my apologies. Uh, just shoot me a nasty email and uh, I'll be sure to include you later.
find a way to edit this uh, and put your name in there. So, And also funding from the NIH. I wish we could get more. Uh, and also funding from the Focus Ultra Foundation. We really appreciate it, and we hope to get more in the future as well. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, um, I guess I will take some questions at this point. Well, thank you for that wonderful talk. It looks like we did get some questions through the chat function. So the first question is, could you talk a bit more about the regulatory challenges with respect to device and drug modalities for pancreatic cancer? And what is being done now to overcome the regulatory challenges? Yeah, I mean, the regulatory piece is is the, the biggest barrier um, uh, to translation. Uh, even just on the device side alone, uh, to get a relatively straightforward device approved, it for, for a PMA device, on average it costs about $100 million to get into the clinic. And that's for, on average, these are therapeutic devices that are highly complex and require a lot of engineering. So you have to have very, very deep pockets just on the device side. And then if you're adding drug to that, um, uh, we all know that drug approvals are even more challenging than device approvals. So, you know, one, it's just the, the, the maze. There aren't a lot of drug device combination predicates. Uh, so it, it it just requires so many people, and and knowing that hurdle in advance, most people quit before they even get started, um, and it's a shame because it's the patients that then suffer. And I think that we have a lot of compelling preclinical data out there, uh, and um, it's it's actually a relatively safe treatment. This is just using hyperthermia as opposed to ablation, uh, and so the technology is all there. The drugs are essentially there, um, but um, you know, my guess is, as as is usual, um, and again, I don't mean to criticize kind of our practice in the U.S., but most of this will probably all be all developed offshore. Um, there have been many times in this process where I've thought of moving offshore just <laughs> so that I could do the research that I want. But I mean, I certainly collaborate with people, you know, all over the world. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's our way to kind of uh, advance this forward. But uh, it would be nice if in the U.S. we had some more uh, clear pathways uh, that weren't so financially burdensome to, to really benefit the patient. Well, if anybody like has any ideas, I'm welcome. I, I, please, please let me know. Looks like we've got some challenges ahead, at least here in the U.S. Uh, so our next question is, how much local doxorubicin concentration is necessary for treatment efficacy, and are you able to get enough in using Bucus ultrasound hyperthermia with a thermosensitive liposome? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I was actually asked uh, on um, uh, the review of the manuscript. Um, uh, it's hard to say um, because uh, we haven't done the survival studies yet, um, but, you know, we think in many cases, uh, even if you see a percentage increase in drug concentration, you have an increased effect. We're talking fold increase. Uh, so w we're fairly confident that we will see um, uh, increased uh, uh, tumorcidal activity. And in, in, in vitro studies, um, again, increasing the, the drug concentration by you know, 20 20%, 50%, you know, dramatically increases the response. So if we're talking several fold increase, uh, then uh, we should we should see a, a significant response. But um, we need to do the studies to demonstrate that. Well, that sounds promising. So the next question is, what technology gaps exist for treatment monitoring that need to be overcome before ultrasound-guided HIFU can be commercialized for applications in the pancreas? Um. So I think I actually had an IDE to study one of the ultrasound-guided uh, HIFU systems back in 2006. So this was approved by the FDA. So can we treat now with current systems? Yes. Based on existing ultrasound technology, yes. And they're doing that all over the world. So um, I think the question more is what can we do to make it more effective or safer? Uh, in order to monitor, and there are, you know, you know various technologies that are challenging but possibly uh, are doable, uh, and they're basically advanced ultrasound imaging te techniques such as elastography or thermo, the, uh, you know, the the the, um, you know, 
the clinical utopia would be if you could do thermometry with ultrasound because that would benefit not just HIFU but RFA, any ablative techniques. Um, so that's um, uh, that's the holy grail. But uh, any type of monitoring, and so with cav that was the benefic benefit of doing cavitation therapy because then we did develop a method that you can monitor it. Um, uh, so it's if, if we just came back from the last uh, ISTU meeting, the International Symposium on Therapy of Ultrasound. There's a lot of work being done on um, advanced ultrasound imaging techniques, and I think that you know it's just around the corner. But you know that's what we were saying about 10 years ago. So, um, but we're there. I, I think that um, it, we're not trying to defy the laws of physics, fortunately. So it's just a matter of developing the technology. So a similar question, um, so you talked about several different ways in which we can use ultrasound to treat pancreatic cancer. What do you see as the most interesting or the most promising moving forward? Uh, I mean, I, I'm a firm believer in drug delivery, so I think the near term, and the reason I say that is it, uh, hyperthermia is going to be safer than ablation. Uh, and. So um, if we can do hyperthermia enhanced drug delivery, I think that really that that offers a local therapy and systemic therapy at the same time. Uh, and uh, I think that um, again, I think that the data is there. So I would say that that would be kind of the near term. The long term, big picture is really immune response. I mean, I think that if we can show that cavitation, mechanical disruption of these tumors somehow enhances an immune response. I mean, I don't, th I think it's naive to think that that's all it's going to take, but, you know, once we work out some of the mechanisms and see if there's some, you know, drug device combinations to enhance the immune response, then high food becomes systemic therapy. And, um, again, it is one of those technologies that is unique or one of these effects that's unique to this particular technology, and, uh, and that will provide a strong foothold for this technology uh, in clinical use. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, well, with that, we will conclude today's webinar. Thank you again to Dr. Wang, and thanks for all to joining us today. Uh, stay tuned to our newsletter and website for invitations to future webinars.